These are the mountains of central Iran. Long ages of wind and sun have sculpted a strange and barren landscape. It's hard to imagine a more stark place than this land of sun and stone. Yet the island of Hormuz is perhaps even more hostile. Shaken by earthquakes, scorched by the sun, it's been called the Gates of Hell. Hormuz is made almost entirely of salt. The island of Hormuz lies about 10 kilometers off the Iranian mainland, at the mouth of the Persian Gulf. Almost circular in shape, it's about 8 kilometers in diameter, rising to 200 meters at its highest point. The Portuguese built this huge fort in the early 1500s. Its purpose was to safeguard the monopoly of the spice route from the East Indies. But the garrison was helpless without fresh water. Practically every drop found on Hormuz is saltier than the sea. These cavernous underground chambers were built as an answer to that problem. The whole massive construction underlines the harsh and arid climate of Hormuz. This chamber once held more than 9,000 litres of water. Only a few briny wells supply the islanders and their livestock. Apart from this, the gaunt hills of Hormuz produce no fresh water. These jagged peaks are not made of rock. They're the weathered remains of an enormous salt dome pushed through the overlying mantle of rock by the collision of drifting continents. Bursting from the cauldron of the Earth's interior, the salt dragged with it an amazing collection of rocks and crystals, everything from hematite to fool's gold. About 85% of the island is pure salt. Any rain that falls sinks into the rock and rapidly becomes too salty to drink. So it's remarkable that the Hormuz gazelle manages to survive. They're quite large antelope. The male stands just under one and a half meters high at the shoulders. Like all gazelle, they're extremely fast. Many desert antelope can exist without much water. They get most of what they need from the plants they eat, but most need some water, especially when feeding their young. Local folklore claims that they purify seawater by sucking it up between their hooves. It's more likely that the gazelles know of a hidden supply somewhere in the hills. Salt-tolerant plants are the only ones capable of surviving here. They preserve whatever water their long roots can find by growing stems and leaves covered with a waterproof layer of wax. An additional way a plant can reduce water loss is to decrease its leaf size. Other plants have reduced their leaves to defensive spines. That way, the plant can protect itself from browsing animals and save water at the same time. But only a few places are productive enough to support even this sparse vegetation. Most of the island is completely devoid of any kind of life. Hormuz seems almost to defy anything to survive on its barren, salty slopes. Inside the island's many caves, there's a deathly stillness. The only things that grow and prosper are the stalactites, and those are made completely of salt.
With fresh water, much more life could thrive on Hormuz. The island does produce plenty of water. It flows in bubbling streams from the base of the salt hills. But it's all super saturated with salt. The streams look almost like alpine brooks, but it's salt that surrounds their margins, not snow. With temperatures as high as 55 degrees centigrade, the sun evaporates the water, making the streams even saltier. Wherever there's an obstruction, the salt crystallizes in strange, coral-like masses. A frog is an unexpected find in such salty conditions. It's mummified in salt, but it must have come from a freshwater source nearby, because frogs can't survive in the sea or salty streams. Even on the seashore, Hormuz has a surprise in store. Shoreline deposits of red ochre turn the sea blood-covered. It may look uninviting, but the seashore is the least inhospitable part of the whole island. Those white, eye-catching flashes are made by tiny fiddler crabs. The male uses his specially enlarged claw as a flag to warn rival males off his territory, a small patch of beach surrounding the crab's hole. If a male is challenged by an evenly matched rival, he'll test the intruder's strength to settle the dispute. The males rarely do each other any lasting damage. The loser's chances of winning a mate simply become more remote. The male fiddler crab's large claw is useless for feeding. He has to rely on his small claw for sifting through the mud. The female has the advantage with two small claws. Just before the tide covers the beach, each crab cuts a disc of mud to cover the entrance of its hole. The disc traps an air bubble, which enables the crab to breathe until the tide goes out again. A fiddler crab wouldn't last long without a bolt hole. Blue herons stalk the beach looking for fiddlers that for some reason have become temporarily stranded out in the open. Another enemy of the fiddler crab lives down at its own level on the shoreline. It's a strange little fish which spends about as much time out of water as in it. The way the fish scuttles across the mud has given it its popular name, mud skipper. The mud skipper lives and hunts for its food on the tide line that divides the salty sea from the even saltier land.
Even with a mouth like this, the mud skipper can find crabs a tricky meal to swallow. These little fish are well adapted to life on the edge of the sea. They can breathe air and their pectoral fins are modified for walking on mud. Males perform elaborate displays to attract females. Their rituals are also designed to intimidate rival males. Animals living in the intertidal zone have to be able to cope with being covered and uncovered daily by the sea. It's a difficult environment to live in, but not as hostile as dry land on this island of salt. Many of the local inhabitants are fishermen, eking out a living in their dows. These people live on the east of the island. Everything slows down here at midday because temperatures often reach a stifling 55 degrees centigrade. In an attempt to keep cool, many of the houses are built with wind towers to catch the breeze. The heat is one problem, the lack of fresh water is another. Desalination plants are being built to provide the people with drinking water, but many of them still depend on tankers. They come every day to offload their liquid cargoes. The water comes from Van der Abbas on the mainland, some 25 kilometers away. Everyone must pay for and collect his or her own water. Fresh water is a precious commodity on this island of salt and it's only used for absolute essentials. Clothes are washed in the sea. While the human inhabitants of Hormuz can make or import water for drinking, the island's wildlife must get it from some other source. Some creatures, like these bees, can get the liquid they need from storage containers around the village. But this supply is not available to the gazelle or birds. There's just one small part of Hormuz where there are definite signs of life on dry land. It's called the Konar Forest. Anywhere else, this sparse collection of stunted trees would never be referred to as a forest. But each one of these trees is a miniature oasis of shade and moisture. This squat, bush-like tree, called a jujube, is well adapted to the arid conditions. Each branch is covered with a defensive array of unpalatable spines. The flowers act as miniature water holes for the bees in this parched salt desert. They provide liquid in the form of nectar. Wherever there's prey, there's usually predators. For the praying mantis, the bee is food and drink. Its flesh provides the mantis with all the moisture it needs.
perched on the very jaws of death is a small black fruit fly. It's attracted by the moisture from the dead bee. A mantis will seize anything edible, even another mantis. The victim immediately goes limp. Playing dead seems to confuse the attacker. Perhaps the mantis thinks it's grabbed a branch. But as soon as the victim moves, it gives the game away and seals its fate. Locusts often get blown to the island from the mainland. Although one of these insects can eat its own body weight of leaves in six hours, they probably aren't doing much damage to Hormuz's already undersized forest. The leaves are so tough and unpalatable, the locusts make little impression on the trees. Ants are the scavengers of this mini-oasis. They benefit from the shade and from any debris that falls from the tree. The ants carry anything they can find back to their nest. Transporting a dead locust requires extra help, but it's difficult for those at the front to coordinate their movements with those at the back. Dismembering the prize soon solves the problem. A fascinating predator with an unusual hunting technique lives at the foot of the jujube tree. Each tiny crater is the home of a creature which sets and springs one of the simplest and most effective traps in the animal kingdom. It's the antlion larva. Having dug a crater, the antlion buries itself at the bottom with only its long, pincer-like jaws showing. As soon as an ant enters the pit, the lava catapults a stream of sand at it. If the ant loses its footing and falls to the bottom, the jaws snap shut and the victim is drawn beneath the sand to be eaten. Living beneath a tree causes problems. Twigs and other debris sometimes fall into the carefully laid trap. Most are easily disposed of. But some objects are more difficult. The jujube seed is too heavy to jettison. The antlion tries to bulldoze it from the pit without much success. At last, the antlion's persistence pays off. Only to be thwarted again. Bees swarm when a queen and her colony are on the move. This swarm, taking advantage of the tree's shade, are awaiting the return of scouts sent to discover a new nest site. Hormuz bees usually live deep in the hills. This swarm has settled for a tiny cave at the base of a salt valley. Inside, the bees are already busy nest building. A cave like this is an ideal place on Hormuz. 
the thick walls insulate the bees against both heat and cold. The worker bees helped to solve one of the most puzzling riddles of Hormuz. They were clustered round a seepage of water close to the shore, and surprisingly this water was fresh. Wherever it had come from, it hadn't been contaminated by salt. The soil above it was the sand of an old shoreline. But this still didn't reveal where the water comes from on an island that gets almost no rainfall each year. There were no frogs living here. On Hormuz, frogs are only found around human habitation and only come out at night when it's cool. They depend on leaking taps from the drinking supply. Another of Hormuz's mysteries is how it has bubbling salt streams without rainfall. The answer is very simple but easily overlooked. The solution was discovered when some rock samples were collected, including one of pure salt, and left outside overnight. In the morning there was a pool of salt water where the salt had stood. At night, Hormuz is stifled in an atmosphere that has a 90% humidity. Every night, the salt rock absorbs hundreds of litres of water from the humid air. Hormuz is probably the most efficient producer of water in the Persian Gulf, yet almost every drop is useless to living things. Only a small proportion condenses on rock and remains comparatively fresh. Hormuz is a harsh place, but for the few creatures that have solved the problems of living here, there are compensations. There's little competition, and until recently, the threat from humans was minimal. But that is changing. Immigrants, development, and industry have all come with the arrival of desalination plants, which will make fresh water readily available. Today, no one knows what the future holds in store for the wildlife which still survives on this island of salt.